Hello, this is Jörg once again with part 2 of chapter 20 from Rulers of Evil, American Graffiti. Last time we stopped reading in the middle of page 215, but for continuous sake I go back up two paragraphs and will continue reading from there and try to bring this chapter, long chapter, to an end. Hope you enjoy it. So, sit back in your chair and enjoy the reading. According to Scottish theologian Alexander Hislop, Caesar consented to deification in order to inherit the huge kingdom of Pergamum. Consisting of most of Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, Pergamum was bequeathed to the Roman people in 133 BC by its king, Attalus III. But there was a catch. The people of Rome had to regard their leader as God. The Pergaminian kings had begun ruling as gods when the title of Pontifex Maximus fled the fall of Babylon in 539 BC. In that eventful year, Persian invaders assassinated the Babylonian king Belshazzar. Just moments prior, Belshazzar had seen his assassination prophesied by the famous handwriting on the wall. Quote, Mene Mene Tekel Upharsin stands for the number is numbered as we can read in daniel chapter 5. ruling as god by divine appointment belshazzar had profaned the sacred vessels of the israelite temple this was the unpardonable sin of blasphemy for which god sent the persians to destroy him now belshazzar's priests were evidently spared rather than submit to the persian conquerors they furtively gathered together all their portable treasures, entitlements, codes, inscriptions, astrology, sacred formula and insignia and fled with them northwesterly to Pergamum. Since the rulers of Pergamum were already practicing Babylonian religion, they were honored to receive the fugitive Babylonian college and their great endowment. Pergamum, the new residence of Pontifex Maximus, became a showplace for despotism. The neighboring Greeks reflected its sudden transformation with the myth of Midas, the king whose touch turned everything to gold. Babylonian rule graced Pergamum with the world's greatest medical complex, the Asclepian, dedicated to the god of pharmacological healing, Asclepius. Pergamum became the most important humanist learning center its library housing more than 200,000 scrolls. Mark Anthony would later move these assets to Alexandria as a gift to Cleopatra. Many of them eventually found their way from Alexandria to the Medici Library in Florence, where we have Medici learning from, learning against learning, and the Medici are also an old papal bloodline, so there are probably a lot of all these scrolls in the Vatican. When Attalus III died in 133 BC, he bequeathed all his kingdom's Babylonian grandeur to the Romans. But no Roman emperor was deemed fit to receive it, because the Roman constitution had never suffered a man to be deified. The bequest lay unclaimed until 48 BC, when Caius Maria Caesar was declared God Almighty in the Serapion, Alexandria's temple of Jupiter. Deification entitled Caesar now to assume the title Pontifex Maximus. To indicate his infinitely holier status, he took the name Julius. The name was a claim of decent from Julius Escanius, the legendary son of legendary Aenas, Virgil's maritime hero who sailed westward with a band of his Trojan fellow countrymen fleeing the sack of Troy by Greek marauders. Assisted by the whole heavenly network of mythic deities, Aenas led his followers to sacrifice their individuality for a glorious collective existence that would one day be called Rome. This is a so very interesting sentence, I cannot go over it without commenting. 
Aenas led his followers to sacrifice their individuality for a glorious collective existence that would one day be called Rome. Now look through our time that we are living in today. Isn't that exactly what the Roman Catholic Church teaches? We are all one, we are all equal, all people are created equal as they say anyway. Yeah? No. We are not all equal. I am different than you are, and you are different than your neighbor is, and you are different than your father and your mother is. We are all individuals. But Aenas led his followers to sacrifice their individuality. That is just the point. There you know where that comes from. And that is not the Bible. But that is Troy. That is Greek. That is Greek teaching. Balamanian. Thomas Aquinas and all the other so-called teachers of the Roman Catholic Church that teach that everybody is the same. You have to give up your individuality to fit in the big mass of where everything has a collective existence and individuality is wrong. That's the teaching of Rome. That's the teaching of Antichrist. And here you know where it comes from. Aenas led his followers to sacrifice their individuality for a glorious collective existence that would one day be called Rome. What is the last kingdom? Daniel prophesied in his prophecy of four kingdoms to King Nebuchadnezzar at Babylon in the time. First Babylon, second Medo-Persia, third Greece and fourth Rome. There you have proof that we are still living in that Roman Empire. And by the actions, when you look around it today and see what the Antichrist, the Pope, is doing and saying in all his speeches and things where he is, you have to be dumb not to see that. Surely, when you follow reading this book, I hope that you finally will understand it that you will finally get it. It is just like Tapa Saucy said when he was in this interview with Greg Semensky, that while he was writing this book and reading these things and researching these things, he said, Can you believe it? Can you believe it? This is one of the points assisted by the whole heavenly network of mythic deities Aenas led his followers to sacrifice their individuality for a glorious collective existence that would one day be called Rome. Aenas was considered the offspring of a union between a human being, Anchises, and Jupiter's wife, Venus. When Anchises boasted of his intercourse with the goddess, Jupiter struck him blind with a thunderbolt. The Aenid, and I told you, remember, um, that I mentioned before that there is a book read out on YouTube of that historic work. If you want to read, read more about this fable of the Aenid, then you can go to YouTube and listen to that audiobook. But you got to be very patient. <laughs> I tell you, it's a long one and it's not easy to understand. But the Aenid opens with Aenas carrying blind old Anchises out of Troy on his shoulders. By taking the name of Aenas' son Julius and claiming descent from him as well, Caesar was able to trace his lineage back to the Queen of Heaven. The divine lineage supposedly flowed through his mother Maria, uh, Maria who was purported to have conceived him without losing her virginity. Maria also claimed to have remained a virgin even in childbirth by having her son delivered from the side in a surgical operation that still bears Caesar's name, still today. Ever wondered where the Caesar uh, uh, Caesar cut came from when they deliver babies without going through the normal birth canal but operatively the C-section as they call it 
Did you understand that Caesar was able to track his lineage back to the Queen of Heaven, that he be of divine, inter, the, the, of divine conception? Yeah, isn't that what in the Bible is said about Jesus? Do you see how the devil counterfeits everything, everything that is written in the Bible, with Caesar and making him Pontifex Maximus and telling the fable, I call it fable, that through his mother Maia, who was purported to have conceived him without losing her virginity, she also claimed to have remained a virgin even in childbirth by having her son delivered from the side in a surgical operation that still bears Caesar's name. All of this quote-unquote fable and endless genealogy which Paul taught the church not to heed, is foundational to American secular government. For it is Julius Ascanius, grandson of Venus and claimed ancestor of the original Caesar, who inspired Anuit Coeptis, the upper motto on the flip side of the great seal of the United States. The phrase which the U.S. Department of State interprets to mean, quote, God hath favored this undertaking, unquote, was spoken by young Julius Ascanius in the ninth book of Virgil's Aeneid. The scene is a battleground. But, yeah, let, let, let's, let's go back to this sentence that I just read. So, the U.S. Department of State says, Anuit Coptis stands for God hath favored this undertaking, right? And that was spoken by young Julius Ascanius in the ninth book of Virgil's Aeneid. What does Virgil's Aeneid, I ask you, have to do with anything with the God of the Bible? With the creator of the world? Nothing! Nothing! It is a deception, people. And if God hath favored this undertaking, it is not the God of the Bible. Because that God was not spoken in any of the books of Virgil's I need. Get that through your heads. Okay, the author continues. The scene is a battleground. The Trojans are outnumbered and fearful. Young Julius Ascanius takes a position in front of his shrinking countrymen. He looks up at an evil giant named Remulus, king of the Rutulus. Remulus mocks the Trojans for sending a boy to fight him. While the giant quakes with derisive slaughter, Julius slips an arrow unto his bowstring and cries toward the heavens, quote, Almighty Jupiter, favor this rebellious undertaking. Audacibus ad nue queptis. Each year I shall bring to thy temple gifts in my own hands and place a white bullock at thy altar. Unquote. Jupiter then hisses an arrow from the sky that strikes Remulus in the head with such force that it passes clean through his temples. The Trojans, quote, raise a cheer and laugh aloud. Their hearts rise towards the stars, unquote. Apollo, from his throne of clouds, shouts the Gnostic credo, quote, by striving so, men reach the stars, dear son of gods and sire of gods to come, unquote. A thrilling story. Does anybody see resemblance to David and Goliath? Well, we are going into that in the next paragraph. A thrilling story. And one that leaves no doubt as to the identity of the God who favored the undertaking of the United States. It was a pagan deity, the God of Julius Ascanius and not the God of the Bible. Surely, if Congress had wanted to show that the new nation was underwritten by Yahweh, God of the Bible, it could have referred to the boy Down's giant story told in the Old Testament. Who doesn't know David and Goliath? 
Charles Thompson's biblical scholarship should, could easily have produced a motto based on Samuel 17, verse 47, where David says to Goliath, quote, The Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Unquote. Reduced to an original language motto at least as comprehensible as Anuit Coeptus, the passage might have appeared in the seal as the Hebrew, and of course here standing a Hebrew word of two that I cannot read, or even in translation, quote, the battle is the Lord's, unquote. But establishing a national government directly on biblical scripture was not the intent, I believe, for the founding fathers, Tapasosi says here. He believes that? No, of course not, because the hidden faith of the founding fathers was Romanism. In all its consequences, it was Luciferianism when you trace it back to the ground. There was never ever the intention to found a biblical country. Listen, the pilgrims who came into that country, who fled most and for all Germany from the old Europe, who fled Ireland, who fled England, and who fled Holland, I mean the Netherlands today, and all the other countries that made all the people out that came in the first centuries after the discovering of the continent of America over there, they knew why they flew from Europe. They knew that the Antichrist was the Pope. They knew that the Pope suppressed them through centuries. That's why it was called the Dark Ages. They went there in the best intentions ever. But the government that was formed over them in 1776, that was not of the same spirit. That is something that you have to understand. Though the people were protestant, the government was not. And of course the government had to be careful not to show its full intentions, who are satanical, to the core from the beginning, because otherwise there would have been an uprising and the government would have probably been kicked out of the United States of America. They couldn't risk that, so they just took time and time and time. And because the country was more or less founded by Jesuits, a lot of Jesuits came into there and they took over not only the pulpit, but they took over the pulpit, very sure for that, and with that indoctrinated the Americans from the beginning of the 19th century or, or the middle of the 19th century with futurism. But they took over the whole education system. And when you take over the education system, what does that lead to? Well, as we uh, read earlier in Rulers of Evil, how many per uh, what percentage was required in a university to have a history class in 1914? What was the percentage in 1939? What was the percentage in 1964? And what was, the, what was the percentage in 1996? Go back and read them. That is how you take over a country, by education and by omitting, through education, history, omitting historic facts. That's how you do it. So the author continues, by establishing a national government directly on biblical scripture was not the intent, I believe, on the founding fathers. Far more useful to them and acceptable to the souls they knew would be populating America in good time were the fabulous vanities of Roman religion. These souls required the sacred icons of burgeoning humanity in uninhibited sexual energy, legends that inspired hot-blooded heroism and patriotism. Consent to images of this character presumed obedience to the omnipotent intelligence hovering inscrutably above the establishment of ancient, stone-heavy, well-ordered, pyramidic hierarchy. 
Less than four years after his deification, Julius Caesar was assassinated by an executive conspiracy. For another four years, civil war raged as two of the assassins, Brutus and Cassius, struggled for control against Caesar's immediate successor, a triumvirate comprised of Lepidus, Mark Anthony and Caesar's adopted son, his biological grandnephew, Caius Octavian Capias. The triumvirate defeated the assassins only to war against each other. Poets lamented that Rome, against whom no foreign enemy had ever prevailed, was being destroyed by the strength of her own sons. Now, what's the comparison to the United States of America? It is the enemy within that destroys your country, not the enemy from without, not ISIS, ISIL, or whatever, but the Roman Catholic Church that works from the inside like a cancer in your country. And not only in your country, in all countries. And I can sing a very loud song of that over here in Belgium. We are so Catholic you haven't even seen that here. Chapel on every 20 meters on the street corner. Get sick of it. Obligations of every kind dissolved, the author continues. Class fought against class. A fog of guilt and despair settled in. The poets yearned for escape beyond the world's borders to a place of innocence and peace, perhaps to a new order of things. Where have I heard that before? In his book about Rome's revolution from Republic to Babylonian autocracy, Oxford historian Rommelt Syme Syme writes, quote, The darker the clouds, the more certain was the dawn of redemption. On several theories of cosmic economy, it was firmly believed that one world epoch was passing, another was coming into being. The lore of the Etruscans, the calculations of astrologers and the speculations of philosophers might conspire with some plausibility and discover in the comet that appeared after Caesar's assassination the, uh, the sign and herald of a new age. Vague, uh, vague aspirations and magical science were quickly adopted for purposes of propaganda by the rulers of the world. Already coins of the year 43 BC bear symbols of power, fertility and the golden age. Unquote. The most influential and enduring celebration of golden age optimism was Virgil's prophetic sounding fourth eclogue. This work was addressed to one of Virgil's chief benefactors, Caius Asinius Pollio, who was consul, roughly equivalent to the office of president today, when Caius Octavian, Antony and Lepidus were reconciled in 40 BC by the peace of Brindisi. Pollio, who represented Octavian at the Brindisi negotiations, introduced Virgil to Caius Maecenas, the media mogul of his day. He had risked his fortune supporting Julius Caesar's rise to absolute dictatorship, and he would risk no less to put Caesar's adopted son, Caius Octavian, in the very same place. He scouted and subsidized the most highly talented artists, sculptors and poets to create a totally new kind of communication. Virgil gave him the most for his money. Virgil developed a new quote-unquote, civic literature, whose pious rhetorical style gently guided public opinion toward accepting the rule of a deified Babylonian autocrat. In writing the fourth eclogue, Virgil borrowed heavily from the messianic verses of Isaiah, whose writings were freely accessible through the Jewish rabbis of Rome. Quote, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and call his name God with us, as we can read in Isaiah 7, verse 14. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, as we can read in Isaiah 9, verse 6. Of course they knew the Bible at that time. Rome was the usurper 
of Judea at that time. Rome was the ruler of Jerusalem at that time. They had access to the writings and they knew the different roots. They knew the roots of paganism and they knew the roots of God. That's why they mingled them. But the author continues, 600 years after Isaiah, Virgil solemnly announced in the fourth Eclog that the Prince of Peace would be produced by the unrolling of a new world order, Novus Ordo Seclorum. Quote, now returns the golden age of Saturn. Now appears the Immaculate Virgin. Now descends from heaven a divine nativity. O oh, chaste Lucina, goddess of maternity, speed the mother's pains, haste the glorious birth, and usher in the reign of thy Apollo. Thy consulship, O Polio, shall lead this glorious advent, and the new world order, Novus Ordo Seclorum, shall then begin to roll. Thenceforth, whatever vestige of original sin remains shall be swept away from earth forever, and the Son of God shall be the Prince of Peace. Unquote. And be sure, I was not talking about Jesus in this quote. The billionaire Mercenas exploited the fourth eclogue in the media as though it were a divine summons for Caesar's adopted son Octavian to take the throne and begin sweeping the world free of sin. A fabulous resume of Octavian was already going around <clears throat> about how a thunderbolt had blasted the city wall of his birth, uh, of its birthplace, Velletre, just prior to his birth and how the priests interpreted this to be Jupiter's way of saying the future ruler of the world would arise from the spot, and about how the Senate, upon hearing this, had, de had decreed that all male babies should be executed, and how Octavian was saved by his mother, who pilfered the stone tablet on which the decree was engraved. Octavian's mother was Atia, of the family of Marias, Atia Maria, a Vestal Virgin, niece of Caius Maria, the man who would become Julius Caesar. When Octavian reached the age of twelve, great uncle Caius became his legal father through adoption. Three years later, in Octavian's fifteenth year, his adoptive father was deified as Julius Caesar, Pontifex Maximus. That's when the propagandists of Messinas got busy promoting the son's divine origins, about how the child was born on September 28, 63 BC, in humble circumstances. Now, do you see anything in this date, September 28? Isn't that interesting, as we know, that Jesus was also born probably in September? because the sheep were still out in the meadows. Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December, as if anything he was conceived the 25th of December, but born he was in September, as all biblical, true biblical scholars agree on. And there we see that also here Satan has his counterfeit. The butler's pantry the author continues, at his grandfather's mansion at Velletre was the place that Charles was born. About how he had been conceived on December 25th by Apollo, who came in serpent form and impregnated the virgin Atia Maria as she lay sleeping on the floor of the Apollonian temple. About how, just prior to the child's advent, the virgin Maria had dreamed that her body was scattered to the stars and encompassed the, the universe about how her husband, too, had dreamed that from within her shone the bright beams of the sun, which then, quote, rose from between her thighs, unquote. About how the toddler Octavian's head was often seen being licked by golden solar flames. The propaganda circulated the story of how the great astrologer Theogenes, when told Octavian's birth sign, which is the Capricorn, rose and flung himself 
at the lad's feet. Theogenes No, the astrological, the astrological ruler of Capricorn, was Saturn, whose second golden age was at hand. Saturn, the celestial mythical father god of Rome and father of Jupiter. Octavian, as the incarnation of Jupiter, would be ruled by Saturn, the most dictatorial house in the zodiac, terrible for his restriction, limitation, control, even to the excesses of fornication and cannibalizing of his own children. No wonder Theogenes flung himself at Octavian's feet. In 28 BC, twelve years after the publication of the fourth eclogue, Octavian entered Rome triumphantly as the Prince of Peace. Like Julius had done, the new Pontifex Maximus received a new and holier name, Caesar Augustus. Quote, Since sanctuaries and all places consecrated by the ogres are known as August, according to Suetonius, unquote. a little mentioning in the brackets here from the author. And like Julius, he was hailed as, quote unquote, son of God. Historian Alexander Del Mar describes the universal acceptance of the divine Octavian in these excerpts from his landmark expos uh, exposition of Roman political deification, the worship of Augustus Caesar in 1899. Quote, in the firm establishment of the messianic religion and ritual, Augustus ascended the sacred throne of his martyred sire and was in turn addressed as the son of God, Divi Filius, whilst Julius was worshipped as the father. This claim and assumption appears in the literature of his age, was engraved upon his monuments and stamped upon his coins. It was universally admitted and accepted throughout the Roman Empire as valid and legitimate according to chronology, astrology, prophecy and tradition. His actual worship as the Son of God was enjoined and enforced by the laws of the Empire, accepted by the priesthood and practiced by the people. Both de jure and de facto it constituted the fundamental article of the Roman imperial and ecclesiastical constitution. Unquote. Now do you see here the resemblance between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God? Speaking about the son of God who just came a little bit earlier than Jesus himself came, the Bible prophesied real son of God, of the only existing God, and not of these fake gods that we are talking about here when we are talking about Romans. Do you see the deception? Do you get it? As supreme pontiff of the Roman Empire, Augustus lawfully acquired and exercised authority over all cardinals, priests, curates, monks, nuns, Flemens, augurs, vestal virgins, temples, altars, shrines, sanctuaries and monasteries, and over all religious rites, ceremonies, festivals, holidays, dedications, canonizations, marriages, divorces, adoptions, benefices, wills, burying grounds, fairs, and other ecclesiastical subjects and matters. The common people wore little images of Augustus suspended from their necks. Great images and shrines of the same god were erected in the highways and resorted to for sanctuary. There were a thousand such shrines in Rome alone. Augustus wore on his head a pontifical mitre surmounted by a Latin cross, an engraving of which, taken from a coin of the Colonia Giulia Gemella, appears in Harduini, the De Numis Antiquis, from 1689, Plate 1. The images of Augustus upon the coins of his own mintage, or that of his vessels, are surrounded with the halo of light, which indicates divinity, and, I have to add, sun worship, of course, and on the reverse, sun worship, s u n -er, <laughs> And on the reverse of the coins are displayed the various emblems of religion, such as the mitre, the cross, crook, fishes, labyrinth, 
and the Buddhic or Bacchic or Dionysian monogram of PX, the Greek Chiro, coming from Cairo, site of the Great Pyramid. You see how it all works together, eh? The Augustan writers furnished material showing that Augustus' incarnation was the issue of a divine father and mortal mother, and that the mother was a wife virgin, that the birth occurred in an obscure place, that it was foretold by prophecy or sacred oracle, that it was presaged or accompanied by prodigies of nature, that the divinity of the child was recognized by sages, that the Holy One exhibited extraordinary signs of preciosity of precocity sorry of precocity and wisdom that his destruction was sought by the ruling power that his miraculous touch was sufficient to cure deformity or disease that he exhibited a profound humility that his deification would bring peace on earth and that he would finally ascend to heaven there to join the father isn't it fascinating how the devil copies everything that God puts out in the original first for us to see and to study through his wonderful world, the Bible? The author continues on the bottom of page 222, if you're reading alone. So universally were his divine original attributes conceded that many people in dying left their entire fortunes to his sacred personal fisc, in gratitude, as they themselves expressed it, for having been permitted to live during the incarnation and earthly sojourn of this Son of God. In the course of twenty years he thus inherited no less than thirty-five million gold array, which is nearly amounting to one billion dollars in 1996 values. In the course of 20 years he inherited what we call today a billion dollars 20 years ago. How much is that today? Probably a little bit more. Eh? And anyway, 1996 values? Pfft, nah, worth nothing. Paper, fiat, currency, Federal Reserve, debt notes have absolutely no worth. But 35 million gold array, that is something you can do something with. <sighs> Many potentates bequeathed him not only their private fortunes, but also their kingdoms and people in vassalage. The marble and bronze monuments to Augustus still extend contain, <coughs> still extend, contain nearly 100 sacred titles. Among them are Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Apollo, Janus, Quirinus, Dionysus, Mercurius, Volcanus, Neptunus, Liber Pater, Savos, or Saviour, and Hesus. At his death, Senator Numericus Atticus saw his spirit ascend to heaven. The ascension of Augustus is engraved upon the great cameo from the spoils of Constantinople, presented by Baldwin II to Louis IX, and now in the Cabinet of France. A facsimile of it is published in Dury's History of Rome. Now we'll see when I make the video that I can get a picture of that in there. America's Great Seal, which still is the subject of American Graffiti of Chapter 20 of Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. America's great seal, the author continues, with its obsessive fidelity to Caesarian Rome, cannot represent a nation more moral than the source of its scripture. The icons and mysterious Kabbalistic language of this seal introduce a preposterous Babylonian gospel, not biblical gospel. Taken seriously, and shouldn't the government's solemn statement be taken seriously? The SEAL's Gospel teaches that America's high spiritual purpose is to assist in the resurrection of the Son of God's mutilated parts from the evil slime of human flesh. It tells us 
that already the Holy Virgin has rescued the Son's sacred heart from the slime, a pluribus unum, one from many, and has placed it high in the vault of heaven, as her five-pointed celestial path describes for all to see. It calls for America to exert fervent sexual energy, so that the sun's many parts on earth might be right united with Unum in heaven. It promises that America will rise toward the pure light of sinlessness and godliness into eternal life as part of the solar body of the sun, S-O-N, the S-U-N of God. It promises that America will rise toward the pure light of sinlessness and godliness. Isn't that what Luciferians teach? The pure light that is Lucifer? Into eternal life as part of the solar body of the sun, the Son of God. It signifies that this cosmic resurrective process is administered by a pyramidic hierarchy conceived in ancient Babylon, exported to Asia Minor and bequeathed to Rome. At the top of the hierarchy sits an unseen chieftain, an unknown superior, a god of the seal who possesses universal intelligence and authority over every soul who confederates with or subscribes to the seal. The god of the seal wields the fasces to sweep the earth clean of the last traces of original sin. He is assisted by a new priestly order, a quote-unquote new world order, charged with destroying all individual identity deemed inconsistent with the resurrection to godliness. Uncooperative governments and dissident citizens alike are cut down by arts of war so frugal that the liquidation increases popular faith in the fascists. Because they function in a golden era of Saturn, the chief and his hierarchy can be depended upon to mimic Saturn's strictness, cruelty, licentiousness, even cannibalism as the situation requires. To the charge that such is impossible in America, one comparison should be sufficient. No sooner was Augustus Caesar deified than he sacrificially murdered 300 senators in Perugia to atone for the assassination of his adoptive father Julius. Likewise, no sooner was an American president inaugurated than he, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, authorized the sacrificial murder of nearly a hundred misguided Christians near Waco, Texas, to atone for what? A growing popular disenchantment with federal government? When we go and speak about Waco, let me sh make sure that you understand one thing very well. There's a five-part, I think, documentary out there on YouTube that you can look up. It's called The Militarization of America. It is a video made by, uh, among uh, another brother, Bob, uh, Bob Treffs. And in part three or part four, they go very, very deep into Waco. And everything that you have heard up to now from Waco, throw it overboard. Watch that video and you will understand what really happened in Waco and you will really understand that that was a sacrifice. That was a blood sacrifice of innocent men, women and children at that time. And it was done under the rule of Bill Clinton. Do you remember Bill Clinton? Didn't he say in the beginning of this book, the worst thing that you can do is underest uh, underestimate your adversary? Didn't he make Professor Quigley his mentor at Jesuit Georgetown University? Don't you think that Bill Clinton was absolutely aware of the Ionid, of Virgil, of all this Roman history that I was just talking about here? 
just doing the same thing that Augustus did in that time by murdering 300 senators in Perugia. He just went over there to Waco to set an example, to say, you are not going against the government. This is so profound, people. This is so in your face. I thank Tapa Saucy really for writing this book. What a wonderful work. Now, I'm going to continue for a little moment. <laughs> what the seal of the United States of America represents to anyone who takes it seriously is a ministry of sin. A speech by Jesuit political scientist Michael Novak published in the January 28, 1989 issue of America, the weekly magazine of American Jesuits, sums it up eloquently enough. Now, before I go and read you that quote that Tapa Saucy put in here, I want to tell you a little bit about Michael Novak. Michael Novak, he is quoted here, and I'm going to read to you what Michael Novak read in the first chapter of the book The Global Vatican that was written by Knight of Malta, a former ambassador to the Holy See between 2005 and 2008, Francis Rooney, which my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, read completely in 99 fantastic parts. You can watch these on the YouTube channel firstamendmentradio.net where his complete reading of the book The Global Vatican is put in there. Now this Michael Novak that I'm quoting now in a minute from Rulers of Evil wrote in the first chapter of The Global Vatican from Knight of Malta written book from Francis Rooney quote By reputation the United States is a Protestant country and Catholics were asserted to be unsuited for it. Yet, virtually every Catholic writer or thinker who visited America since 1607 has been excited by the country's extraordinary consonance with Catholic faith. Unquote. This is how the book The Global Vatican by Knight of Malta Francis Rooney opens up in the first chapter that deals most and for all with the carols and the real founding fathers and of course by that you learn of the faith they had of the United States of America the carols that are never taught in your school the first chapter of Global Vatican deals with that and that same Michael Novak that opened that book in chapter 1 there we can read off a quote here in Tapasosi's book, Rulers of Evil, on page 224. The quote is the following. Sharpen your ears, people. Quote. The framers wanted to build a, quote-unquote, novus ordo, that would secure, quote, liberty and justice for all, unquote. The underlying principle of this new order is the fact of human sin. To build a republic designed for sinners, then, is the indispensable task. There is no use building a social system for saints. There are too few of them. And those there are, are impossible to live with. Any effective social system must therefore be designed for the only moral majority there is. Sinners. End quote. Now do you get it? America was founded for sinners. And not only America. Because he says... To build a republic designed for sinners then is an indispensable task. There is no use building a social system for saints. Who are the saints? Bible-believing Christians. And something that comes very well out in that interview that Tapa Saucy gave on Greg Szymanski's or Greg Anthony's interview there. Look that up. Look that interview up. 
He says it for himself. You cannot put a Bible-believing Christian as President of the United States of America. How? How can he rule with the principles of the Bible all these evil people? It's impossible. You have to have evil people on the top to rule evil people. So you know that as long as you are ruled by evil people, you know that you are probably evil yourself. Or at least the majority of your population. Now look at the majority of your population, see if you belong to that and see if you are evil or not. Are you one of the sinners that country was built for? Or are you a Bible-believing Christian who belongs to the kingdom of Christ where there is no sin because you repent of that sin, because you have a king, because you have a Lord up high who died for you, who died for your sins, who shed his blood 2,000 years ago. Where do you belong to? I'm going to continue after repeating that quote from Michael Novak once again. The framers wanted to build a Novus Ordo that would secure liberty and justice for all. The underlying principle of this new order is the fact of human sin. To build a republic designed for sinners, then, is the indispensable task. There is no use building a social system for saints. There are too few of them, and those there are, are impossible to live with, from the standpoint of the sinner, of course. Any effective social system must therefore be designed for the only moral majority there is. Sinners. Social systems are for sinners. Because Bible-believing Christians do not need a social system. And why don't they do that? Why don't they need that? Well, read your Bible and you will understand. Whenever social security or all that stuff comes into your country, run! Run! If you can. The author continues. In the next chapter, we shall examine how faithfully the Founding Fathers reconstructed Babylonian Rome on the banks of the Potomac. That will be chapter 21. And that chapter 21 is called Jupiter's Earthly Abode. And... I want to make you warm for that. As you probably remember, I already read in the last chapter what in this chapter will be talked about. Jupiter's earthly abode. Well, I'm going to take a little break from reading because I got other things to do. But when I come back, I come back in full charge reading chapter 21. Up to here. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. At least as much as I did, I hope. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, don't forget to do your own studies, do your own research, study the Bible, study the New World Order, which is nothing else than the Old World Order restored. Come to Christ, come to Jesus, come to His Word. Until next time, God bless you all and bye-bye.